Samir Tagiev is one of our Canadian small cap portfolio managers. And Samir, let's uh, let's dive right in because we've got a lot to cover today on what might seem like a pretty simple question, which is what's the right way to figure out what something is worth? And so presumably you spend a good chunk of your day thinking about this, right? <laughs> yes, a lot. Cool. Well, I, I, I was thinking of this in, in a couple different ways. There seem to be three basic problems when it comes to uh, what a company might be worth as I thought about it. The first was, well, how do we know what the future holds? How do we know what cash flows the company will be able to generate? The second problem being, well, how do we decide what those cash flows are worth today? And then the third problem being, well, how do we know that we're right? How do we know that other people will agree with, uh, with our assessment? Is that, is that kind of the basic problem in, involved? No, that's a very good way of looking at things. Say, if I would translate that into our uh, lingo, our internal lingo, it would be uh, looking at the discounted cash flows, so valuation, and you mentioned the cash flows um, that we'll get in the future, which is uh, uh, forecasting that is a challenge of itself. Uh, uh, coming up with the ranges of that uh, is a challenge of itself. Then the discounting it uh, at what discount rate should you get it at? And the third, we would look at it from, uh, well, do we have an edge um, mm. internally uh, versus the market? Uh, what are we missing here? Uh, because if you do everything right, and it's very easy for others to do that right as well, then, well, probably uh, you will get a very fairly valued um, uh, security. And so all of this is uh, um, for nothing. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. Okay, but I mean, and I, certainly we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about discounted cash flows, specifically in the environment that we have today about just what the appropriate discount rate is, but it's worth acknowledging that there are other ways to uh, to look at the value of, of what's in that be. And I'm just wondering if you can talk through just briefly some of those other methodologies, um, why they work and then maybe why we've chosen to uh, to ignore them in, in terms of our process. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so most of people uh, out there look at multiples uh, with the uh, there being a very huge uh, range in terms of the multiples as well. There's uh, P multiples that we people would look at, um, which can be useful at times, but they have their own problems. People look at EV, EBITDA uh, multiples, uh, which I would argue as uh, the most amount of uh, um, potential problems involved in them and people get very creative on those as well but if we concentrate on PE uh, for example it kind of makes sense you get a price which is very observable mm -hmm. and you get earnings and it's typically uh, either current earnings or your projected earnings for the next four months um, it might make sense but there are problems involved with that so um, price is observable but the earnings themselves you make an assumption that the current earnings are a good proxy for the very future uh, earnings that you'll be getting in the future. Right. Um, so that might not be true. So and there's a couple of problems with that. The, the current earnings might be inflated. Uh, they, there might be a lot of growth coming in. There might be a lot of uh, capital expenditures that you would need to finance all of that growth. And none of that gets um, incorporated within the multiples. So we've seen that um, uh, there's actually quite a bit divergence uh, in terms of the answers our DCFs would give us whether a um, company is undervalued, overvalued, or fairly valued, um, and the P's that uh, the rest of the people would look at. So price to earnings multiples, price to cash flow multiples, uh, those things are quick uh, shortcuts. They're useful from that perspective, but um, I think, like you said, uh, miss out on a lot of the actual fundamentals of the business, whether it's improving or deteriorating, that those those things would miss. Yeah. Um, I would like to uh, give one example. Sure. Uh, it being um, one that stands out in my mind is um, uh, we initiated in two specialty insurance companies in uh, one being in Kenyan small cap and one being in U.S. mid cap, Trishura and Kinsale. Well, looking at the insurance companies, most of them trade at 9 to 12 times earnings. But the thing is, these businesses are different from your typical insurance companies. Um, and they were trading at 25 to 35 times earnings. Oh, wow. Well, um, so there's a huge uh, divergence. Uh, you would say that, look, uh, this is a very overvalued um, uh, operations, but... 
actually, once you do the um, business analysis, management analysis, and only after the uh, try to put it all in into the discounted cash flow models, you realize that there's a lot of um, growth potential for these businesses, but also the quality of the earnings that you would get are higher. These are specialized insurance um, businesses that are not as commoditized as other participants um, in the PNC space. And uh, the management teams are doing a really good job for capital allocation as well. So it shows up in um, the uh, qualitative assessment of the business, but also in the future that it just does not boil down really well into very simplistic multiples that people would use. In fact, we've seen, um, so in this case as well, we've seen where companies that would be high in multiples, people shy away from it, but actually the multiple may not be as high enough uh, to justify for the uh, growth prospects or the qualitative aspects of the business. Sure. And there might be businesses that, you know, trade at nine, 10 times earnings that look optically very cheap, but the cash flow, you're not really going to get it. Yeah, it's going to be misallocated. And as a result, it's not even worth that much. Uh, it should be way lower. So DCF gives us a very good picture inside out of the business of what it actually should be worth. Yeah, it's almost the way you describe that. It makes me think that um, if, if uh, multiples are sort of very myopic because you're just looking at current earnings or earnings for the next year, uh, you're missing out a lot of context as to how that business might have evolved historically, or I think more importantly, <laughs> how it might evolve uh, going forward. So let's um, let's move to discounted cash flows. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I, I think I'm most interested in just the actual discount rate, but I, I do want to give a sort of complete uh, view of our approach to them. Uh, so maybe just start there. What, how does that process start? Uh, what are we what are we actually doing when we build out a discounted cash flow model? Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to start out with actually not DCFs, but before that. So uh, even doing DCFs, we would uh, do qualitative assessment of the company. And that is the uh, first filter um, for many competitors of ours. I've seen the first filter typically is valuation. And what do you end up with? After that sieve, you ended up with, the, uh, I guess, uh, the um, undervalued on PE, but might be um, low quality businesses. So the first uh, sieve for us is the business quality and management quality. And only after that, only after we get uh, comfort around our ability on um, projecting future cash flows, which is not an easy task. It's a, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, probabilistic thinking that the world uh, might go in very different ways but the companies with um, high quality, business quality, as well as management quality, it uh, handicaps your um, uh, future cash flow scenarios. It's still a very uh, uncertain future, but you get that huge um, uh, range of cash flows that might happen. And then the second question becomes, uh, well, what the discount rate is, should be, uh, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, and the, the DCF in itself is not just one piece saying, uh, giving us an answer that, oh, this uh, stock should be worth 20, maybe 50, maybe two, maximum $150 per share. Mm -hmm. uh, it The answer is not in the range alone. That is helpful to get a rough sense of the valuation of the ranges. Uh, but the a lot of the value comes from getting a sense of the sensitivities on actually opening up the model. Mm -hmm. and looking what moves the valuation, um, what uh, kind of scenarios are priced in, and uh, are there scenarios that um, may not be uh, uh, may not be incorporated in an analyst's or PM's work. So this is why we, in our e-weekly um, meetings, when we're discussing uh, finished work, and then someone uh, came up with an idea and um, did the research wrote it up as well as uh, did the model. We're not mm -hmm. only just reading their uh, reports and discussing the quality of aspects, we actually open up the model as well and play with it um, together with a, uh, as a team, um, trying to stress test uh, different assumptions and see uh, to get a feel of the valuation, if this is uh, undervalued, overvalued-ish, uh, 
um, or and also get a better sense of the business in itself. I think that's really interesting, that concept, because I just the very simplistic way that I've thought about it is, okay, you do a lot of the fundamental qualitative work on the competitive advantages, the management team, and that that provides you with context for filling out your discounted cash flow model and you know, forecasting what you think uh, revenue growth or margins might look like going forward. But if I'm understanding you right, it's, 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 it, it actually goes both ways. Uh, the modeling can actually help you better understand the business too. Yeah, it can help us understand the drivers of the business. So one example that comes to mind most recently is uh, we looked at our um, commercial real estate brokerage uh, uh, businesses that we hold. Again, in Kenyan Small Cap, we own uh, Colliers. Mm -hmm. And in um, our U.S. Mid Cap, we own CBRE. Uh, both of those two are very large um, uh, players in the commercial real estate uh, brokerage space. There's uh, Molt involved in the scale of those businesses and the management teams are two best management teams we could find in uh, that industry. Um, so there's a lot of interesting parts, a lot of uh, attractive parts involved with these companies, but one caveat being this is a cyclical business and uh, the amount of um, activity in the commercial real estate business um, space is going to impact their cash flows. So it was really helpful to um, open, for example, a Collier's model and look at how much cyclicality is priced in into the company and look at the historical uh, trends as well. Well, one of the um, learnings that came out of that um, was that the, according to the uh, model, according to the wide range of scenarios, the current price probably does not incorporate what can come in uh, in terms of the um, drawdowns in the um, real estate market, in terms of the okay. activity in that market. But also the model, it was harder to incorporate their future acquisitions. And this um, and the management team is very well versed uh, in uh, capital allocation and has historically made a lot of um, value for shareholders through acquisitions. So it, it gives you a good picture of what needs to um, appear in this business. So there's the cyclicality side, that is probably there's some um, down, there's a risk involved in the model, not capturing it uh, as much. So we tweak that a little bit, but also we tried to t tweak it with acquisitions and they kind of canceled out, but it gave us a good picture. Okay, it's about cyclicality, but also it is about the acquisition. So going forward, they, these are the two uh, KPI to areas that we need to monitor and uh, ask management teams about. Got it. So those are things that are important. Second part of the framework that uh, I, I, I talked at the beginning is just what are future cash flows work today? The, the discount rate, I think, is really top of mind for um, uh, a lot of our clients, a lot of investors today, just given what's happened with inflation, interest rates. Uh, um, I think a good case can be made that a lot of the correction that we've seen in markets so far this year is really just the mathematical impact of, of higher discount rates. And um, I have to confess, I, I run experiments sometimes on my children. <laughs> uh, I've got three of them. There are two, four, and six. And I um, ran this, this case where I said, like, hey, um, I can give you a cookie, but if you don't touch it for five minutes, you can actually have two cookies. And my two-year-old said, forget it. She just ate the cookie. Um, the four-year-old, uh, sorry, the six-year-old was a lot smarter. He waited patiently for the, the five minutes and got his two cookies. Uh, and the middle guy really struggled. <laughs> mm. he, he made it five minutes, but man, was it hard for him to, to keep up. And it just, it got me thinking about this idea that, yeah, the, the discount rate that you choose uh, really, really matters. So can you talk about that? Because at least from my perspective, if you've got a very high quality business, um, you probably have decent visibility into projecting cash flows and margins. Um, but when it comes to the discount rate, that seems to bump around a lot more and it just seems a little bit fuzzier in terms of how you, you actually end up with the value of the company. So I, I don't know if that's the right framework, but maybe just start there. How, how, do, you, how do you figure out what the right discount rate is? No, uh, that is a good question. And by the way, I uh, I love that you're teaching uh, the interest rate uh, uh, effects to your uh, children from this uh, early age. Um, but th th there's a lot of uh, different um, ways of doing things. 
I guess the way I was taught in schools and the way it is taught in schools is through this CAPM mm -hmm. uh, model, which it would be um, capital asset pricing model. Um, and the discount rate, the answer uh, on discount rates in there uh, from that model is that we should look at the risk-free rate mm -hmm. and we should include some equity risk premium and mm -hmm. multiply it by our um, beta of the stock with the core assumption being that stock volatility is a good proxy for the risks of those cash flows that you will get in the future, which is a, uh, a weird assumption to make that the stock market volatility is going to have some impact or is going to calculate the uh, future volatility of the cash flow as well as well. It works sometimes, but uh, one thing that I'll uh, point out uh, as well that it's a lot of times it is the companies where the stock is volatile, mm. uh, but they, there's a divergence between the stock and the actual underlying quality of the business. Got it. And if you get a comfort around that, you have a um, you have a better knowledge or better understanding of uh, the cash flows and low risks involved. Well, that's an opportunity. While CapM becomes a very uh, almost self-inflicted wound, where the stock price uh, being more volatile. Uh, undervalues the business potentially uh, as well. Got it. Okay, I think that's that's what I remember too. Going through the CFA program, uh, very much the cap in model. But the, but, but there were other uh, ways um, uh, of building up discount rates as well. And I think we've uh, fallen out in a different camp, right? Yeah. No. Oh, some people also uh, look at fixed uh, rates. You can discount your cash flows um, taking a very fixed. Uh, rate. There are problems with that as well, um, especially with the interest rates out there moving. Mm -hmm. um, how does that impact your valuation? And this is not just a um, theoretical uh, concept, but practically as well. Even if I, as a portfolio manager uh, in equity specifically, um, would not have an opportunity to invest in a government bond or other kinds of bonds. Well, for asset allocators uh, out there, as well as general capital out there in the world, well, equities is just one venue uh, to allocate capital into. We need to have a good sense of the price for capital in general, which would be a um, uh, good uh, proxy for that would be the sovereign yields, um, especially in the US which would be considered more risk-free. Well, that gives you a good picture of what the price for capital is and um, whether there's, uh, uh, what should be your benchmark for um, your return expectations. Okay, and so, all right, that makes sense to me. You start with a risk-free rate. Um, I mean, if you're investing in Canada or in the US, that might be your uh, Canadian yield curve or your, I don't know, they call it the 10-year uh, treasury yield. Um, but 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 we're trying to um, we're trying to figure out what to discount in the future, and different businesses might be more or less risky, uh, either based on their business model, um, based on where they operate, different parts of the world, uh, how trustworthy their, their their management teams are, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just just can you talk about how we layer on additional um, uh, uh, these additional considerations in terms of the discount rate? Yeah. So we would start with a risk-free rate, um, which would be the sovereign rate for that particular business. And if the business is uh, global, we would uh, look at the weighted, uh, I guess, uh, sovereign rates uh, where this business operates. And um, we would look at uh, the debt risk premium uh, to calculate the cost of debt and equity risk premium that you would all overlay on top of the risk-free rate and to come up with the cost of equity. And it's your very textbook exercise of looking at the weighted um, uh, average cost of capital for a business. There are a lot of nuances involved in there. Uh, so for example, um, what should be the is, uh, equity risk premium um, <laughs> that needs to be added for the business? Well, that's a very huge nuance. Yes. Um, and one thing that I guess that is taught in schools, but this breaks down when you face the reality is that, well, things cannot be quantified as easily. You cannot just take a beta 
of a stock and uh, use this as a um, good risk premium um, a lot of things start breaking down so it mm. becomes more of an art rather than science uh, by getting a it's only after going through uh, tens or hundreds of different companies do you get the sense of the uh, of the uh, risk involved with the business and what should be a, a good risk premium but i would say that in general it would be about 300 to 600 basis points so three to six percent on top of the risk free rates that we would use uh, internally three percent being for the highest of the highest of quality businesses um, it's touched a very or it comes to um, uh, comes up pragmatically very rarely and then there's businesses that I've personally applied 10% additional risk, pre uh, risk premium just because I'm very aware of the risks involved in this business. Mm. There's some attractive um, things involved uh, with this business, but uh, I don't want to undervalue risk either. Your, your comment on the art, of, the art versus the science. Um, yeah, I think this is the thing that interests me the most is... Um, like now that interest rates are higher, your discount rate really matters um, just because those future cash flows are worth so much so much less today than they were, say, uh, a, a year ago. And even when, as you describe the various ways in which we build it up, so you know the sovereign curve plus the credit premium plus the, the equity risk premium, like I, I see problems with each of those. And yeah. <laughs> I'm just so curious how you tackle them. Um, so for example, on sovereign yields, like, okay, that, that makes sense to me. Um, in, in the US, but like, what do you do about sovereign yields in uh, some sort of uh, emerging market or higher risk country where inflation might be higher or currency might bounce around a lot more, or even in um, countries that have, uh, you know, that would be considered more developed, but where there's been like massive central bank intervention uh, in terms of yield curve, um, yield curve manipulation. Like how, how do we get around that uh, with respect to that part of the discount rate? Well, that's where uh, it becomes more uh, fascinating, more interesting, because uh, if it was that <laughs> easy here. just to uh, <laughs> pull the numbers up, we would hire a lot of mathematicians instead of <laughs> really business ana uh, analysts. Uh, you're right. For the countries um, outside of uh, U.S., Canada, the ones we're most used to, the ones with that we feel comfortable uh, as business owners, as capitalists to be in, there's more risk involved. And uh, in my mind, it... Uh, Four primary risks that come in uh, for um, looking at those companies it would be uh, political risk well are you sure that you are as a business owner your property <laughs> rights are protected mm -hmm. there's inflation risk a lot of the countries and uh, do struggle with a lot of inflation and currency risk as well uh, we're really fortunate to live in countries where uh, currencies are uh, very stable and uh, but there are a lot of countries out there where uh, currency devaluation is just norm of life. Mm -hmm. um, so what sovereign rates uh, do you use? One school of thought would be, well, use the sovereign rates of the countries where this business operates. The mm -hmm. thinking being that sovereign rate of another country should involve the very risk-free rate for the international investor, that being the probably U.S. Uh, risk-free rates, U.S. government bonds, plus a premium for to um, to compensate you uh, for all of those risks and credit default risk of that country as well. Well, that is all great. Uh, that can work, but there's a, a, also a lot of problems in there where um, this issue actually came up um, uh, for in our internal discussions. We're looking at one of the companies, um, it being a Japanese as well as a Taiwanese companies. Um, well, a 10-year yield in Japan is 0.9%. 10-year mm -hmm. uh, yield in for a Taiwanese government bond is 2%. If you think about Taiwan, there's a lot of, I would argue, even though it's a stable country right now, but there is this looming potential risk of a war with China. Do you really want and to give uh, your money to the Taiwanese government for 10 years at 2%. Well, it's just uh, 
on a day that we're recording, which the 10 year in the US is at 425. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So there's something else that is going on in there. So our decision to use the sovereign rates um, and Taiwanese sovereign rates to evaluate the Taiwanese company, for example, may not be the best. And this is where the judgment of person comes in. Um, perhaps we should look at um, incorporating some other um, sovereign yield that for example, U.S. sovereign yield, or perhaps we should uh, compensate for that by uh, controlling our uh, risk premium. Yeah, better if you just, compensating. It's a sum of three numbers basically. So you just you yeah. move it from one part to the other if you feel it's, yeah. If it's one not. side was shuffled, well, yeah. you can uh, compensate by um, increasing another number. Can, can you talk just a little bit more about um, how inflation? impacts this whole process. So presumably that gets reflected in in um, in sovereign rates, although like we just talked about maybe maybe yeah. not fully. Um, you know, what other challenges does inflation cause you to your job in, um, in valuing companies? And this is fascinating because uh, three years ago, this may not have been uh, as much of a, a top of mind topic to talk about. We've been used to um, the 2% or less inflation rates for such a long time that, and they've been stable for such a long period of time uh, that our way of doing things has been to look primarily at the nominal interest rates because mm -hmm. inflation is going to stay about the same. Well, things might be changing now with the volatility increasing, both for the interest rates, but also the inflation, uh, current inflation rates, the inflation expectations going forward. Um, at times it was uh, helpful to look at business from the real dollar perspective. So uh, the, the whole model building or the whole exercise becomes the exercise of not thinking about the nominal dollars, but what is the current um, dollar that you're getting on this business as a profit and instead of your growth rate being for example four percent don't think of it as four percent think of it as your inflation rate going forward and plus or minus how much more inflation or deflation is this business going to get if it's a very mm -hmm. competitive business they may not have much pricing power to drive that growth above the inflation rate um, so instead of looking at 4% and our inflation expectations just for the sake of a number being 3%, um, then the real uh, growth uh, expectation that was baked in was only 1%. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that might be the better way of looking at things because, well, if the interest rates are going to move uh, and inflation expectations tomorrow are going to move to 4%, well, you you model things on real dollars. So your 1% um, expectation is still going to be the same. It's, if only your business quality, business runway, management quality assessments change, you would impact it on the uh, real dollars, um, on the real premium, I guess, for the growth as well. Are there different types of companies uh, where that might be like where you might be more inclined to say, hey, we should look at this in real terms versus in all nominal terms. That would be, that's a good question because there's a lot of companies out there that have really high quality cash flows, but those are nominal cash flows. The ability of those businesses to increase their um, pricing might be very limited. Um, so, which would be very counterintuitive um, compared to the thinking of um, that we've been used to in the low inflation world. One example would be software uh, mm -hmm. businesses. Well, once you start getting into the inflation world, the software businesses out there start, get, uh, start splitting up into two camps. The ones that it'll be very hard to price uh, the valuations of a lot of the business uh, software that is actually sold to governments, mm -hmm. um, there might be lower uh, ability to price through um, the pricing. And they and why, are... If I can interrupt, what, so why is that? Just because the contract has already been established? Uh, because there are large customers who can impose their 
their bargaining power? Like what's the... Exactly. So I, I've seen uh, software companies where the um, contract is five year uh, okay. term or sometimes uh, way uh, higher, uh, way longer. Uh, and there's some CPI adjustment or there's, um, call it 2% inflation uh, incorporated escalator okay. uh, included in there, but 2% is not that helpful when, for example, you're facing inflation rates of today at 8%. And or, then there's some software yeah, companies that, costs, uh, all that yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there's some, some software companies that would be able to do that. Okay. It's also very interesting. Um, in the recent uh, look at one of our real estate holdings for Main Street Equity, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, looked uh, looking at what were our assumptions from three years ago, well, inflation that we put in was 2% uh, going forward. Well, real estate typically has done a very good job of capturing inflation, especially mm -hmm. if it is in areas that are not as strictly regulated. So in Ontario, um, where we reside, you know, there's uh, pricing regulations. You cannot really push inflation, uh, sorry, the uh, rents more than 2%. While they are mostly in Alberta, and in mm -hmm. Alberta is pricing presets every year. And look, uh, over the last year, the pricing for rents in Alberta has increased, sorry, in Calgary has increased 30%. Uh, that oh, wow. just shows you uh, very high um, even though it's a commoditized business, a uh, very high inflationary protection uh, ability of that business. So perhaps for that case, it is better to look at it from the um, real cash flows and real interest rates perspective rather than uh, trying to predict nominal cash flows. Um, and we don't really know where inflation will end up in the future. Well, uh, yes, absolutely. We, we don't, I mean, <laughs> clear. Clearly, looking back, uh, things have not gone the way that we would have thought they would and the way nobody thought they would with respect to, to inflation. Um, but uh, that brings another question, which is just time horizon. So inflation is very high today. Um, I mean, there's a chance it could be this high for, for a long period of time, but presumably it'll, it'll start to come back down um, just, just given the base effects. How, how do you... How do you manage that in thinking of um, discounted cash flow models that are 10, 15 years in, in length? Uh, that is another, uh, I guess, fascinating part of this exercise. Uh, we do this, uh, you're right, they, uh, they move a lot. And interestingly, they also impact uh, the valuations by way more than you would expect. Um, uh, for some businesses, we would, for example, toggle, uh, change our um, premium assumptions mm -hmm. by 50 basis points, by 100 basis points, sometimes even more, and see what the evaluation impact is. And we do this uh, every week on uh, um, every weekly meeting uh, discussing a company, uh, getting a better sense of relative to other companies, what is the duration of this stock of this company, a duration of the cash flows uh, mm -hmm. that we'll be getting. And how, how much your assessment of intrinsic value changes based on your... Exactly. Your, it's your not about... Yeah. yeah, it's not about getting things right right now. It's about having enough flexibility and enough um, headroom um, for a wide range of scenarios where things can change a lot. It'll be the interest rates, it can be the... Um, business quality expectations. It can be some management um, capital allocation uh, decisions over the future. And we try to, we solve for that by, I guess, changing the numbers as a team and discussing it. Is this possible? Uh, how likely is this? If that happens, how much is, is it going to impact, for example, the interest rate number or uh, growth number or capital allocation, the um, outlays of the business? and see where, how has the valuation has changed and gives us a better picture of, well, what is the, what does the valuation hinge on? And also gives us a, a better picture of uh, this model more likely, uh, is saying us uh, that this company is more likely than not is overvalued uh, or 
vice versa. Okay. If, Samir, if I could summarize just for a while before we, we kind of conclude. Um, so I, I see the value in discounted cash flow models. The, the, the work that you do to understand companies, their competitive advantages, the way their cash flows might evolve going forwards, uh, that can be reflected. And so you are incorporating quality of management and, and the business model into your, your assessment of cash flows. Um, it sounds like a pretty sound model for, for discounting which is a combination of uh, sovereign curves where the country operates, plus a credit risk premium, plus some equity risk premium reflecting um, uh, risks uh, specific to that particular company. Um, and importantly, I think we've, we've mentioned this a few times, but just trying to figure out what's important and testing scenarios. So uh, using Monte Carlo simulations in our, in our models, just to understand if the world uh, evolves in different ways, what kind of sensitivities that, that we might have. Mm -hmm. So that all sounds uh, good in theory. We've talked about some of the, uh, the problems <laughs> uh, involved or just some of the, the pitfalls in, in discounted cash flow modeling. And I, I guess that's where I'd like to ask you in the end is just um, where do you come out of this? Is, is um, just given some of the challenges that we've talked through, um, is it worth spending as much time as, as people do on, on discounted cash flow models? No, absolutely. Uh, with one caveat, remembering that DCFs are not just one answer. Uh, my colleague J Jeff uh, puts it really well uh, in saying that valuation is the bluntest tool in our disposal. Just being aware of the limitations of the tool that you use, not being blindly uh, following the models. And there's a lot of judgment in it involved. We don't need to know what are exact uh, valuation parameters for this company. The um, answer is a grayer answer, which in what percentage of the uh, scenarios will this company be a good investment and not? And by what percentage, I don't mean a quantitative answer, but mm -hmm. a feel for uh, this company. And if you do that across all of your portfolio positions, it will give you a good answer on, wait a minute, this company is more, see, it feels more overvalued while this other company seems more undervalued. Why? Uh, you need to overlay risks into uh, understanding, well, perhaps we shouldn't uh, add more to this particular position because of the additional risks that you would be taking as a portfolio. But if we do have some ability, well, perhaps um, we should. So the valuation comes in as only one, um, one input into the decision-making. Uh, valuation is not, uh, is not just one input. Um, and uh, there's also another element to this. Um, most of the businesses out there are castles built on sand. Uh, what I mean by that is there's no good malt around these businesses mm -hmm. and the cash flows are very, very uh, fragile. There's no good ability to understand why, sh why should this company keep on earning uh, more cash flows, uh, similar cash flows and growing cash flows deep in the future. Uh, it's only very few companies that are able to um, protect their excess returns on capital by the competitive advantages. And that is why uh, we always start with the question of business analysis and management analysis. What do you think that we as a company could do better um, from an evaluation perspective? Or put, put differently, where have you seen us make, make mistakes? Well, by we, um, I would actually look at it as uh, as us, not just one we, but multiple we's um, as a team. And every team member is different. One, um, one potential aggressiveness that I see over and over in models is actually a very low range, very, uh, very... Um, a very tight range for the valuations outcomes, but also the inputs that can play out. It is very uh, natural to people yeah. to underestimate the um, wide range of outcomes that can happen out there. 
So uh, that is one. And I, listen, I find this uh, about myself as well, opening the models that I did uh, 40 years ago, the world turned out very differently uh, for years. So this um, is the idea right. that um, if you ask somebody 10 questions and you ask them to put a 90% 90, 90 confidence interval around the answers to those questions, uh, chances are only five or six of their answers will, fly, will fall within their 90% confidence interval. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's why we'll, we'll, that's their foundation, I guess, of our investment philosophy. That's why we'll look at the uh, high quality businesses because, again, most of the businesses out there are built on the castles built on sand and it's only when you have some foundation that you can have some ability to predict. Otherwise, uh, the human nature of overanalyzing, underestimating the uh, range is going to take over. Well, and to be fair, for a good chunk of the last 10 years, um, a low and stable interest rate environment did provide for pretty narrow ranges uh, in, in terms of some of those those variables, but clearly uh, that, that's been turned over. Um, right. I got a different question for you, which is you, you talked about thinking of things as we, recognizing that you and the rest of the people on our team are uh, you know, in spreadsheets, uh, you know, well, obviously speaking to management and, and doing the research, but then reflecting that in, in discounted cash flow models to get a sense of valuation. How, how do we ensure consistency? Um, you, you talked about that example of um, uh, the Taiwanese company, but you know, who's to say that somebody else on the team wouldn't have a different approach to thinking about the discount rate and, and how do we ensure that internal consistency across, across companies that we're looking at? No, uh, there's a lot of different potential answers uh, in terms of how you can do things. And I think one thing that matters, no matter how uh, differently you do things, uh, it's just consistency as you mentioned, across uh, different holdings in the portfolio. If you're doing certain things in one way for a, a particular company, you should keep that in mind for the rest of the companies in the portfolio as well. So it, it, that's where the consistency of method uh, and logical consistency, I guess, within um, different models uh, comes in. This is why we discuss things as a team uh, where the theory being that that should compensate for potential uh, quirks of every analyst and every portfolio manager where we try to bring down the um, overestimations, underestimations or different ways of looking at things, um, measuring that and playing with the numbers all together and getting a general feel of the valuations. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that rhymes with a lot of what we've talked about on other podcasts. Uh, yeah. It's great to have lots of different perspectives but the need to have a mechanism for that to be shared. And like you said, for that consistency to, to be applied. Mm -hmm. Listen, Samir, um, I found that a fascinating topic. <laughs> uh, I hope our listeners did too, and just really appreciate your taking the time to, to talk us through discounted cash models today. No, a pleasure to be here.